let's jump in. Welcome everyone. And thank you for being with us for the Food and Climate Panel Beyond Carbon Markets. I'm Amy Antonucci with Seacoast Permaculture and the NOFA New Hampshire Education Committee here to get the evening started. I'll do a quick word on Zoom etiquette, which is the same as you're always told. Please stay muted if you're not talking, um, but feel free to have your video on. We love seeing everyone. And note that we are recording this event to post online later. Tonight's event is sponsored by Seacoast Permaculture and NOFA New Hampshire. Seacoast Permaculture's mission is to empower and teach individuals and communities to work together to create sustainable culture through the use of permaculture in the New Hampshire Seacoast and beyond. NOFA New Hampshire actively promotes organic, regenerative, ecologically sound farming, gardening, eating, and land care practices for healthy communities. Let's take a moment to acknowledge that we are growing, living, and working on the ancestral lands of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land, the waterways, and the people who have been in relationship here for many generations. Tonight's panel is a follow-up from one that we did last winter where we delved into the many problems with the payment for ecosystem services models. We will briefly review that topic, but mostly tonight we are focusing on alternatives that do work. We're going to hear tonight from Julie Davidson, Stephen Leslie, Caroline Gordon, Earl Hatley, Abe Collins, and Kat Buxton. Note that you can go ahead and use the chat for questions as we go along and we will get to them in the later part of the program. There might also be time for hand raising and hearing from you, but um, chat will be one way that we'll take, take them for sure. So first up, I want to welcome Julie Davison, the president of the board of directors, directors of NOFA New Hampshire. Um, please, just join me if we can see you and welcoming her. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much, Julie. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. And can you see the screen OK? I just have a few slides to share while I'm talking. Great. So as Amy said, last year in our webinar, we made the case against carbon markets and other false nature-based solutions. These terms are marketing and finance-driven language used to describe a wide variety of programs exalted as solutions to climate change and what we're referencing um, or what we're referencing to in the webinar last year and this year, um, including natural capital, ecosystem services, natural asset companies, ecological asset trusts, common asset trusts, wetland mitigation banking, carbon offsets, carbon credits, just to name a few. Um, and in a recent, um, the um, well, the source is listed below in this slide, but the red monitor substack, they, um, share, they share the top 10 reasons to abolish the carbon offsets. And while I won't go into them all now, they, they um, represent um, some real good reasons not to engage in carbon markets. And I'd encourage you to read the article to dive in deeper on that. Um, but what I will share are a few examples from that list um, and point to both global and local examples of this happening in our community in, in the past year. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, so one carbon offset, offset projects frequently lead to land grabbing, human rights abuses, primarily in the global south. And here we see a photo of Kenya's Ojik people being evicted for carbon credits. Um, the Ojik are on the front line of a false climate solution that is used to justify ongoing evictions and emissions. Here in New Hampshire, um, we have um, the Blue Source Sustainable Forest Company, a carbon sequestration company, acquired the Connecticut Lake head headwaters working forests, about 3% of New Hampshire's working forests, 146,000 acres in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. And they've displaced, displaced many foresters, canceling um, leases, 
and it's impacting a number of industries, even re revenue that the state rely on. And it's coming into conflict with conservation easements that retain the property as an economically viable and sustainable track of land for the production of timber, plywood, and other forest products. And what Blue Store's sustainable forest company is using this for is for carbon credits. And if you look at the list that I showed prior, one of the things that they um, list of one of the top 10 region reasons, and I'll just go back here quickly, um, is that um, the offset carbon accounting has been discredited, and they often assume that the carbon released from fossil fuels is equivalent to the carbon absorbed by the trees. Um, and another uh, couple of reasons that are on that list, offsets repeat a flawed inequality-driven foreign direct investment model. Um, the offset logic reproduces a colonial construct. And here I'd like to just share um, a framework for a just transition um, developed by movement generation. On one hand, you see um, principles and views of an extractive con economy, and a lot of that has to do with the governance. And on the other side, you see um, principles and structures that promote a regenerative economy. And that's where we have deep democracy. And these models really entrench power and centralize it with a few and not with the many of the people that are impacted um, by these false solutions. And with these terms, what these terms share in common is the use of financial mechanisms to enclose and commodify nature, financialization of the environment, further extending the power and reach of financial institutions and corporations. The clever marketing of these tools have co-opted terms such as biodiversity, ecosystem services, nature, et cetera, as an attempt to pass as a climate solution, while the intent is really to drive profit and growth to investors, further concentrating wealth at the expense of the general population. They are not doing this unaided. Nonprofits have joined forces further supported by the USDA matching of public funds to de-risk de the sector and accelerate and address the poor adoption rates of offsets and other programs. This includes the first step in investing in climate smart commodities, then hev investing heavily in measurement verification reporting and other initiatives. With the recent passing of the Growing Climate Solutions Act and release of the agricultural and forestry offset and carbon markets um, done by the Congressional Research Initiative, they're paving the way um, to promote um, carbon markets within the USDA. They are also creating a federal advisory committee to provide recommendations on protocol standards, methods, qualifications, creating a registry of qualified technical assistance providers and third party verifiers. How they'll approving those, I don't know yet. And a list of widely accepted protocols. This sets the stage to assemble the actors and make the biggest play for wealth we've ever witnessed. This year, our webinar is designed to highlight real solutions to the climate crisis. Since last year, those of us serving on this panel have encountered continued acceleration of intentional insurgence of these programs in our local communities. The main objective of these false nature-based solutions is to extract, extract profit, not to heal climate. If our government, corporations, and investors were sincere about solving the climate crisis, they would cut to the chase and pay the land stewards who've been using organic permaculture and other practices to heal the land. Instead, they have developed an opaque labyrinth that has disoriented us and wasted precious resources and tax dollars rather than paying the stewards directly and taxing the polluters and offenders. I'm just gonna go to my next slide here. They have convinced everyone that this is the way, there are no alternatives. When we create policy and programs that dissect the relationships that exist in nature, paying for carbon, or water or stacking biodiversity credits, we lose sight of the whole in the relationships between water, carbon, soil, and within nature. And we make different management decisions that impact a singular outcome, often at the expense and not the enhancements of these relations and ecosystems. We need solutions that address the root cause. We need to be creative and imagine new possibilities. In the book, The Art of Possibility, the authors speak to the practice of framing possibility calls upon us to use our minds in a manner that is counterintuitive. 
to think in terms of the context that governs us rather than the evidence we see before ours. It trains us to be alert to new dangers that threaten life. The danger that unseen definitions, assumptions, and frameworks may be covertly chaining us to the downward spiral and shaping the conditions we want to change. Each of our panelists tonight will help you frame what is possible in their comments, such as compensating land stewards directly, policy in laws to return democracy to our governance processes, and programs that are already assisting farmers in frameworks for managing complexity and living with nature, not a part of it, so that we can, in the words of Chile Yazi, we take care of the earth and we can take care of each other. Thank you, Amy, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Julie, for laying that groundwork for us. That's wonderful, um, if a little terrifying. And I know you're going to put some of those links into the chat, so thanks. Yep. Um, next up, Stephen Leslie. He is the co-manager of Cedar Mountain Farm and Cobb Hill Cheese Company, both located at Cobb Hill Co-Housing in Heartland, Vermont. Stephen is a soil health advocate and farmer activist. He is a writer of many articles and two books on farming with draft horses. Um, join me in welcoming Stephen. Thank you. Beyond carbon markets, why conservation may be our best hope for surviving and even thriving in an era of abrupt climate change. When we think about solutions beyond carbon markets, progressive conservation offers us a hopeful and doable path to a livable future. Conservation touches so many sectors and interweaves a broad intersectionality of related issues, including affordable housing, access to land, farm viability, rights of nature, climate mitigation and climate refugee resettlement, to name just several. To address all these pressing issues, we need to reset our economy back onto a realistic ecological footing if we are to ever find our way back to living in balance with natural systems. In the 2023 session, the Vermont legislature passed the far-reaching conservation measure Act 59, known as the Community Resilience and Biodiversity Act. The bill follows President Joe Biden's 30 by 30 and 50 by 50 executive order, which sets a goal to conserve 30% of all land and waters nationwide by 2030 and 50% by 2020, by 2050. A 30 by 30, 50 by 50 initiative was also adopted in December 2022 by international delegates at the COP15 gathering on biodiversity held in Montreal. The biodiversity bill comes in recognition that this is an era of the Anthropocene. Humanity faces a moment of great peril. Earth has now entered the sixth mass extinction and we are not exempt. But as the bill's champion, Representative Amy Sheldon, Chair of Natural Resources Fish and Wildlife Committee has said, this bill is focused on getting the definition of conservation correct from the start and then creating a plan for how we can meet the goals. By presenting us with an opportunity to assess our current standards and measures of conservation and then chat charting a path forward, Act 59 has the potential to become a transformative policy tool. I hope you will agree that the conservation strategies proposed here are applicable across our region. Right now, agriculture occupies 50% of the terrestrial surface of the planet. 70% of the fresh water used by humanity is devoted to agricultural purposes. One half of all arable land has been degraded and desertified. In the US, soil loss on agricultural land averages five to six tons per acre per year. Less than 5% of the continental US landscape remains ecologically intact. In Vermont, it is estimated that fully one half of our soils have eroded since the 18th century. We have lost 30% of our prime ag lands since 1987. How can we change this picture? Act 59 will include conserved farmland within its inventory. These conserved farms could be granted incentives to adopt certifiable soil health and water quality practices. It is time that our soils receive their due recognition as a public good on a par with legal protections offered to air and water. Such recognition would clarify that the state has a fiduciary responsibility to its citizens to ensure, to restore and protect our collective resource, soil resources. 
Act 59 presents us with an opportunity to develop a statewide consensus among all conservation groups as to what constitutes best management practices within the context of the stated goals and to ensure that all lands included within the inventory meet this criteria. The goal to conserve 30% of land by 2030 should include the parallel aim to have New England farmers produce 30% of the food consumed here, as outlined in the New England Feeding New England Initiative. The very best way to ensure that conserved land is also restored land is to grant incentives and price supports to land managers who adopt soil health practices so that they and their employees can earn a living wage currently estimated at about $23 per hour in Vermont. This is the crux of ecological and economic justice. Vermont and New Hampshire's woodlands are part of a much vaster system in the Northeast, comprising 26 million acres of mixed hardwood and boreal forests. This Northern forest system is already helping to address climate change through carbon sequestration and an array of other ecosystem services and is a crucial reservoir of biodiversity. But all of these benefits will be lost if these forests continue to be fragmented. Going forward, if we are to halt forest and farmland conversion, it will be critical to link conservation goals with progressive zoning that allows for denser, affordable housing within our villages and towns. Mature forests are the least prone to wildfire during drought and have the greatest capacity to infiltrate heavy rains from precipitation events. If the ancient forest that existed here prior to European settlement received nine inches of rain in a 24 hour period as occurred this past summer, all that water would have been slowed down and there would have been no catastrophic flooding. 50% of the carbon stored in a forest is held by the top 1% of the biggest trees. New findings show that young trees are net emitters of carbon until they reach about 10 to 20 years. And that sequestration is greatest from the growth period of 50 years to 150 years. And it's continuous after that. Roughly 80% of Earth's remaining terrestrial biodiversity lives in forests. In terms of immediate impact in the midst of the climate crisis and loss of biodiversity, the most consequential action we can take in the Northeast is to protect our mature forests. The renowned ecologist E.O. Wilson advocated for a half wild earth because he believed that's what it would take to keep planetary ecosystems functioning. His vision did not include the monetization of conserved lands or carbon trading schemes and the expulsion of traditional and indigenous peoples, so rem reminiscent of the enclosure period of the Middle Ages but that has often been the unfortunate result of corporate and governmental collusion in half wild initiatives. More recently, studies by the United Nations have documented that land under indigenous people's management retains 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity, even though in many cases it is working land under intensive holistic management. That's how it was here when the ancient old growth forest was under the caretakership of the Abenaki kinship. Although Vermont has recognized four Abenaki bands, they do not have any tribal territory. The passage of the Biodiversity Bill presents us with an opportunity to redress past wrongs by legislating that a percentage of public lands be placed under the management of the Abenaki. Currently, 75% of Vermont forest is in family ownership. 96% of all timber harvested in state is from these private lands. Vermont already has 25% of its lands protected under a variety of conservation agreements. We can meet and exceed the 30 by 30 goal by simply halting logging on all land within the boundaries of state and national forests and declaring them as ecological reserves. Progressive conservation recognizes that all creatures in the natural world have an intrinsic right to exist and that we must leave space for the more than human world. Act 59 mandates that 10% of the total of conserved land be designated as wilderness, with the other 40% of the 50 by 50 target remaining as working forests and farms. This can be a win-win for humans and non-humans alike if these working lands are managed with soil health management systems that restore landscape function and biodiversity. We can sustain a local timber harvest while managing for biodiversity by making ecological forest management a requirement for enrollment in the use value appraisal tax abatement program 
commonly known as current use. Ecological forest management aims to improve timber stocks through select cutting while placing equal value on habitat restoration. Promotion of a certified ecological forest management could help jumpstart a local war movement in the timber and wood products industries. After all, do we really want old growth lumber imported from British Columbia to build with in New England? If we really care about our own forests and planetary health, we must focus on reducing consumption and waste. Rather than focusing on short-term gains, we need to start thinking of our forests as our strategic carbon reserves and reservoirs of biodiversity. Passive management should be an option for all enrollees in current use. We can also offer landowners a second tier of enrollment by creating additional tax abatement to those who opt for permanent conservation, thereby providing an annual benefit in addition to a one-time payment for the sale of development rights. A third tier of tax abatement could be offered to landowners with underutilized ag land who enter into a conservation easement that includes granting access to farmland to, do, to new farmers and those who have been historically disenfranchised. We need to call out and place a moratorium on false solutions such as burning biomass for electricity or biofuel for heating. Burning biomass for energy has proven to be a dirtier fuel than coal. Commodity ag biofuel production degrades soil and diverts calories away from feeding people. Neither should land designated as conserved be enrolled in carbon credit trading schemes. Our focus needs to be on restoration of the carbon cycle, not on finding ways to help polluting industries keep on polluting. To meet our binding greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets, we need to elevate healthy soil as an essential ingredient. Investment in incentives for land managers to adopt soil health practices has proven to be the most cost-effective way to sequester carbon. We need to maximize the restoration of the carbon cycle within our farms and forests. When the state rewards land managers for implementing soil health practices as payment for ecosystem services rendered, it is not a carbon credit exchange. It is a soil and water and air quality net gain for everybody. The implementation of the biodiversity bill can serve as a catalyst to reactivate the conceptual framework of statewide land use planning. We need this kind of broad inventory of our remaining natural resources to respond realistically to the climate emergency. We can improve and build upon existing mechanisms to develop a culture of regenerative working lands. This will require the agency of natural resources to engage in enhanced levels of interagency cooperation especially with the conservation districts and greater inclusion of NGOs and citizen advocacy groups. This kind of statewide and regional holistic strategic planning is essential to the relocalization of our food economy and energy systems that are necessary for our region to withstand all the shocks and disruptions predicted to affect existing supply chains. We can heal the environment and people, provide meaningful employment, all while producing more food fuel, fiber, and medicine for our region. Of the many dangers and challenges presented to us in the advent of this new era, chief among them in the policy arena is that when climate-driven disaster strikes, all our collective attention, energy, and resources are understandably diverted to staunching the wounds. We need the commitment to reach our conservation goals by promoting the adoption of regenerative organic land management even as we step up to try and keep everyone safe and whole in the midst of mounting environmental crises. It is incumbent on us to get the good word out to policymakers and the general public alike that the conservation of farm and forest land is our last best chance to ensure the continuance of a secure food system, a vibrant rural economy, and to pass on a livable, livable planet to the next seven generations. All my relations, thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, Not sure, there we go. <laughs> thanks. Um, next, I wanna introduce to you Caroline Gordon. She is a legislative director of rural Vermont. She's engaged in changing laws so that sustainable farming practices become economically viable. And she wants to maintain farming in a way 
that increases communal participation and collaboration among producers. Join me in welcoming Caroline. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, a little bit about myself to start. Um, I'm, I'm not just the legislative director of Hoover Mond, I'm also a beginning sheep farmer from Tunbridge. And I came to the US in 2017, starting with Hoover Mond in 2019. Um, yeah, after moving here from Germany, where I was born and raised, and just had finished a four year apprenticeship program in agriculture. And while I was working as a farmhand for 50 euro cents an hour for those four years, I learned that even the organic farmers very much struggled to create viable livelihoods for their families and workers through farming alone, even when they receive premium prices. They all rely on some sort of off-farm or non-farming income. I realized that the policies in Europe were not designed to support and incentivize small-scale farming, but that they were designed for industrial-scale agriculture. But then it became evident that only organizing and advocacy could change this trajectory. This week, as there's another COP climate summit taking place, and it's the same climate activists there um, present from the international peasant movement La Via Campesina and other grassroots organizations that call out the political elite's false solutions around emission trading schemes and net zero goals that have been anchored in the Par Paris Climate Agreement to perpetuate the real changes needed by crediting polluting industries. Rural Vermont is contributing through organizing education and advocacy to a continued resistance to private markets and emission trading schemes in Vermont agriculture and forestry and against the monetization of nature. Together with everyone on this panel, we are actively working on a statement and coalition building to uplift the actual solutions farmers need on the ground. We are all part of the same grassroots movement that organizes in spirit at this time. At the Farm to Plate conference, food system stakeholders come together to engage in policy discourses. This year, land access for farmers stood out as the main topic of concern as inflationary property prices make it close to impossible for beginning farmers to buy land in Vermont. At Rural Vermont, we often hear from farmers about this and know that many decide to leave the state after having searched for several years. At Farm to Plate, Stakeholders identified common issues with the over 80 different support programs for farmers in the state that all have different application requirements and deadlines. A, knowing these resources and B, navigating them while farming, working part or full-time jobs and managing a family is sheer impossible. In many ways, NRCS and the state programming is nothing but a patchwork dumpster that's unsurmountable and still works no different than 60 years ago. Farmers are not interested in a digitalization of agriculture that turns farming into a computer game of models to credit carbon pollution. Instead, technology, software, and the internet should be used to streamline visibility and access to existing programs. In addition, it's also true in Vermont that the programmatic landscape is poorly designed to serve the needs of small-scale diversified farms other than dairy. It's not a coincidence that on dairy alone, our self-reliance is a little bit better and closer to 50%. Farmer surveys that our small farmer group on soil health policy organized independently with the help of conservation districts highlights that what farmers demand is specifically to one, expand the flexibility of programs and their funding scope. In 2023, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets funding requests from the governor were underfunded by the legislature up to 50%. Farms need fully funded agricultural programming. Two, fewer and more flexible programs. Instead of adding to the existing patchwork with new limitations and stipulations around funding, the agency sh should let farmers be the innovators of the practices they are interested in implementing and offer more and not less flexibility in their conservation practices. That may mean that some programs could be made obsolete and consolidated through pro programmatic reform. Three, expedite project turnaround. Streamlining also processes and project timelines could reduce delays and improve efficiencies around implementation and completion of projects on farms. Four, more transparency and support on navigating and leveraging payment schemes, rates, and cost sharing. Farmers stress that even though some support is available to them, it's the cost shares that make it hard or impossible to finance projects. The legislature and other policymakers need to more seriously consider farmers' perspectives needs and policy recommendations. And that would include to improve the accessibility and efficiency of the programs available to them and to double the funding baseline. Farmers need the legislature to become active on this now. 
This year, the legislature passed the 30 by 30, 50 by 50 legislation that our board member Stephen Leslie already so eloquently and passionately talked about. Through a new definition of sustainable land management, this legislation ties enhancements to biodiversity to agricultural practices as a qualifying element for ag land to count towards the conservation agenda. Be sure that rural Vermont is already mobilizing to engage in this new public process where pre-existing frameworks are all up for discussion. We know that many conservationists have a distorted view on the Vermont landscape and what the role of agriculture might be for our climate resilience and food security now and in the future. At last week's first public event on the Vermont Conservation Strategy Initiative, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board head Gus Sailing falsely claimed that Vermont certainly has enough acreage to feed itself and that already 25% of, of Vermont would be conserved so that we are only looking at an additional 5% target for 2030. Obviously, VHCB failed to acknowledge that Vermont currently imports over 96% of the protein consumed, 91% of the fruit consumed, 98% of the grains, and also over 71% of the vegetables consumed in the state. It can be difficult to cut through the limitations perceived around solutions that may or may not be politically feasible. What type of land access policies are even thinkable if we agree that solely financing some land access won't solve the issue around price inflation and the potential for corporate land grabs in Vermont? As an anecdote, just to open people's minds with an example from elsewhere in the world, in Germany, a, de a development project outside of town centers is only permissible for certain named purposes. Agricultural and forestry activities or market gardening purposes are allowed but other development projects need a special permit and ensure that there's not a conflicting public interest, such as the interest of nature conservation, the preservation of the countryside, the protection of topsoil, or even the concern that a project could distract from the natural character of the landscape or from its function as an area for recreation. The new conservation vision for Vermont includes a phrase that has legal relevance in this context. It says, that Vermont would support the historic settlement pattern of compact villages surrounded by rural lands and natural areas. Well, in planning law, this development pattern is called central places principle and is what Germany codified in the construction code I just referenced. It has led Germany to concentrate their development on less than a tenth of its landscape while also developing efficient public transportation and keeping the rural landscape indeed open. So even though our Vermont lawmakers wrote the central places principle into the 30 by 30 vision, I think we all know that this ship has sailed here in Vermont where there's a spider web of private dwellings all over the mountains already. So what policies are even politically feasible for keeping the working lands open and to better facilitate land access for farmers? It is the current use program to, that's designed to preserve the working landscape, pr preserve the rural character of Vermont and to protect the natural ecological systems and natural resources of the forest land of Vermont. That's the programmatic purpose. Making current use mandatory would mean that the review of the existing conservation categories would consider the prime agricultural soils in Vermont and how intact or resilient the historic farms and farmlands across the state currently are to recommend a new conservation category that would protect agricultural land from development through mandatory current use. In terms of accounting for the 30 by 30 goal, this would make agricultural land count because it would meet the definition of conservation that requires permanent protection from development more than just a voluntary program. Rural Vermont knows that another current shortfall of the current use program is that the tax revenue doesn't benefit farmers or indigenous communities, but only the landowners. That must change. A change to the law could affect that law owner, landowners who don't farm themselves, but who lease their land that's in mandatory current use, don't get the tax break themselves, but instead this tax benefit gets fed into a newly created land access fund that would benefit farmers and indigenous communities. A new land access policy of the state could then give farmers and tribes the right of first refusal on property that's in mandatory current use and the option to purchase and finance the land at agricultural value for the purpose of farming or indigenous uses. This way, the state of Vermont could choose to simply amend an existing program to become mandatory and install a mechanism that would address the dire circumstance of a lack of affordability of farmland and price inflation that currently denies land access to the next generation of young farmers 
and to the Abenaki people on which unceded territory we all live. This idea around mandatory current use is only one policy proposal. Obviously, there's more opportunities to discuss here, like protecting soil as a public good, similar to, to water, like Stephen suggested, a wetland current use category without any property taxes, more flexibility for housing development on farms with conservation easements, using mitigation areas for farmland access, and more. Please check out this link that I'll put in the chat from New England Feeding New England. It's the Vermont State Brief that details all the facts around our current state of local self-reliance, the issue of farmland access for farmers, local land loss projections, and more. If you like what you will all hear today, um, you can also, and you also see a great need for land access to farmers in Vermont, then my best recommendation for you is to let your senators and representatives know that, know that now before the legislative session and to engage actively in this public discourse and make sure Vermont will not be subject to corporate land grabs, monetization of nature, unethical banking of our privilege on the pollution of other US states or other lands and communities around the world. Thank you for your engagement and support. And I'm passing back to Amy. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, we're gonna move on now. I wanna introduce Earl Hadley. He is the co-founder and the board president of Lead Agency Inc., a predominantly Native American grassroots organization based in Oklahoma. Earl serves as a board member for the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition and for Rural Vermont with Caroline. He's a member of the Vermont Environmental Justice Advisory Committee and president of the board for the Otakwichi Water Protectors Association in Quichi, Vermont. Join me in welcoming Earl. Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, Kawhi, everyone. Uh, I'm, um, yeah, so let's just jump right into it here. Um, I downloaded this because I wanted to show you all where we are with the market on uh, uh, payment for ecological services and carbon trading and uh, of note, is down here in red, the uh, voluntary markets. Uh, you'll see that they've collapsed. In fact, most of carbon trading has collapsed and uh, nature-based offsets are down 76%. Uh, so this is where we are. I just pulled this off of the uh, uh, stock market, the stock exchange. And uh, this is notable because um, um, we uh, uh, we're in COP twenty eight right now, and uh, what I'm finding is is uh, uh, a UN report that shows that uh, first of all uh, the the governments in in the uh, Paris Agreement are increasing their production of fossil fuels by one hundred and ten percent by twenty thirty. Actually, the U.S. is uh, doubling its its uh, fossil fuel production, and uh, um, this is getting us into a, a big problem. And uh, um, we're uh, blowing past 1.5 C, and and by uh, uh, by 2050, uh, blowing past uh, two degrees C. Uh, we should be. Uh, We'll be hitting 1.5 degrees C next year, 2024, uh, and uh, um, uh, this is uh, uh, very concerning. We'll be uh, uh, hitting uh, 1.7 degrees C by uh, uh, 2030 and, and 2 degrees C uh, at least by 2050. I downloaded this from Berkeley Earth. Uh, in September, uh, we were at 1.37 degrees C. So why are we increasing our production of fossil fuels of all things right now? And what's going on at COP28 uh, when this is all being brought to us by the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear industry? Um, it's uh, quite puzzling. Um, so uh, carbon markets are down, fossil fuels uh, are increasing, and uh, the, our governments are uh, going in increasingly the wrong direction. 
um, and uh, it is all not making sense to me. Um, but in my world, I'm looking at uh, uh, USDA programs uh, that we can utilize that, um, you know, uh, payment for ecological services uh, are, can be, uh, you know, out of the picture uh, with these. And, and, uh, uh, and so Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, or SARE, is one program that I'm utilizing right now with my uh, uh, Abenaki uh, agricultural uh, and gardening projects that I'm doing here in Quichi. Uh, and uh, that's a program that uh, is helping to fund a, a part of our work here. Uh, we're getting a, a, a matching grant uh, for that. Uh, it's a, a educational project uh, teaching uh, Abenaki agriculture. And uh, as a demonstration project, uh, it's a uh, food sovereignty and, and uh, food security project for the Upper Valley here in Vermont and uh, USDA and uh, 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 is uh, helping with this uh, through this program. Another program that I've utilized in the past, um, uh, conservation stewardship program under NRCS and another program within that, the EQIP program is another one that I've utilized uh, in my uh, previous home state of uh, Oklahoma. And uh, there uh, I lived on a, a 490 acre uh, farm um, in the Cherokee Reservation. Uh, my partner there uh, uh, inherited this farm from her parents. Her mother uh, got this uh, uh, farm through uh, originally the Cherokee allotment and uh, um, they added on to it over time and increasing it from the original 160 acres to the 490 acres that it is now. <clears throat> I lived there for 24 years and and uh, uh, her father uh, you know graced cattle on it but this uh, entire property uh, never saw a plow. In, in its entire uh, history of the world. And so uh, when he passed away, uh, we began working to reestablish um, the tall grass prairie to uh, 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 bring back the uh, uh, prairie grouse and uh, 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 restore it to uh, native habitat uh, through uh, equip and uh, CSP. Um, and uh, now uh, researchers uh, from all over Oklahoma are coming out uh, and marveling at the uh, pasture. It was overgrazed, uh, but it had never been plowed. So all the uh, native seeds were in the soil. And uh, as over time, uh, through mowing and uh, control burns, uh, it uh, began coming back. So the native flowers, the native grasses uh, were all uh, there and were allowed to come back. Now uh, researchers are coming out and the uh, Yuchi Nation uh, is uh, out there gathering seeds uh, in order to uh, help reestablish uh, the native flowers, the herbs, and the uh, native grasses uh, that are lost in the, uh, uh, the prairie lands uh, of Oklahoma and Kansas uh, that are lost, uh, lost to uh, grazing and uh, the plow, and uh, where farmers are wanting to uh, restore their lands our seeds on this property are now being utilized to do that as a result of this program. And so uh, payments were made to help conserve this uh, property in order for us to be able to do this. And uh, uh, this is an example <clears throat> of what can be done, uh, two examples of what can be done. And uh, um, 
another uh, uh, thing that that I'm utilizing uh, these programs for is on uh, uh, Indian lands across the country. Uh, we started out uh, using uh, traditional ecological knowledge um, to uh, clean up uh, Superfund sites on indigenous lands, uh, both in Oklahoma, and then it got it caught on, and and we've been doing it in uh, on tribal lands in other states. And uh, the uh, um, agricultural side of these tribes uh, also started, uh, you know, uh, tagging on to what we were doing because you know we were also restoring the uh, the uh, ability of these. Uh, soils to uh, uh, become agriculturally productive. And, uh, and so now we're on to uh, using this for to help regenerative agricultural farmers, native farmers. And uh, we're using a combination of biochar, which is an ancient technology coming from South America, combining that with uh, uh, mycology uh, microorganisms that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Comanche Nation in Oklahoma are developing uh, in combination uh, with the biochar and uh, to restore uh, soils in, on these sites that, that we're doing this on and combining that with uh, phytoremediation plants, which can uh, are uh, we're using hemp and, and uh, other uh, plants that also are a great agricultural product that these tribes are also getting into. And so this uh, combination uh, is uh, a uh, regenerative agriculture restoration uh, project and agricultural project that we're now doing in Indian country across the country. <clears throat> and the USDA is funding us in doing these projects uh, on agricultural lands, on, on uh, native lands uh, across the country through EQIP and uh, uh, CSP uh, programs, and now SARE. In fact, we're using SARE now uh, for a lot of, uh, of these projects. And uh, uh, they're allowing us to use these three methodologies uh, uh, in the SR, SARE programs. And so um, this is a way that farmers uh, can uh, uh, restore soils, build healthy soils, and utilize these uh, uh, NRCS USDA programs in order to uh, get grants and get reimbursement payments uh, for using these uh, technologies to uh, uh, rebuild their soils through regenerative and, and uh, organic agriculture. And uh, we're finding this is really working out well where, where we're utilizing it. And so uh, getting back to uh, you know, getting back to payment for ecological services, uh, we're being uh, pushed by, some folks to say, why not get PES in order to help uh, pay for this? Uh, <clears throat> as we uh, explained in our last year in 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 the in this uh, uh, webinar, um, all in, in in utilizing carbon trading, all you're doing is is just. Um, really uh, hiding emissions that the uh, uh, payers for these credits uh, want to hide and you're not really preventing climate change because you, you're just masking uh, carbon pollution. Um, I would offer an alternative. Why not in, instead of PES, uh, getting uh, big ag and oil and gas uh, corporations to help fund farmers make the transition uh, to regenerative and organic agriculture that supported big ag's bigger is better uh, movement back in the 1980s 
that drove farmers off the land back then uh, with GMO seeds, fertilizers, pesticides, uh, herbicides uh, that ruined our soils in the first place. Why not get the funding from them to help continue uh, servicing these programs that uh, this generation of, of regenerative and organic uh, agriculturalists could utilize in order to to transform agriculture from this monoculture uh, system that was started back in the 80s to the new regenerative and organic agricultural systems that we need now to sequester the carbon into our soils to cleanse our atmosphere and at the same time regenerate our soils. And so uh, I'll leave you with that idea. I want to thank you all for uh, <clears throat> you know listening to me and uh, for attending this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, we'll leave you. Thank you so much, Earl, for those really inspiring on the ground examples that you have to share with us. Um, next, I want to introduce Abe Collins. Abe is a co-founder of the Land Care Cooperative. He's been a grazier with dairy and beef cattle, sheep and goats. He is certain that capable land stewards and communities can cooperate to heal our common catchment homes. Welcome, Abe. Rem yeah, Thank there you, you go. I'll jump into it. Uh, community cooperation, watershed contracting, and economic democracy to heal our watershed homes. I'm going to start by going back 500 years ago to enclosure in England and tracing an unbroken cultural and legal tradition through to today. And this is the legacy of the English aristocracy that we're living with as we struggle with enclosure by payment for ecosystem services and other appropriations. So it began with the enclosure of the English commons, a well-known story, which displaced the former serfs on the land, and they became the English working class, and their labor became a commodity. Private, uh, credit was privatized uh, with the creation of the Bank of England in 1694 in somewhat unholy alliance between the crown and uh, bankers. And then we had the colonization of the Americas, Africa, Asia, Australia, and the people and land of the colonies were turned into capital assets. Again, this is the same cultural and legal traditions going back to the doctrine of discovery of the Catholic Church, combined with John Locke's labor theory of property and his second treatise of government. And these things were merged together and said, hey, we cross the ocean, we lay claim, we offer a requerimiento, which is the equivalent of a modern carbon contract, uh, saying, unless you accept these terms, all this is ours. And it was read in Latin, as is common with these legal documents. So the people and land of the colonies were turned into capital assets. We had enslavement, the creation of real estate and commodities. Ideas are turned into intellectual property. Genes are patented and seeds are patented. Data is extracted and commodified. Our use of platforms like Facebook, for example, create behavioral futures, predicted and modified human behavior. And we have ecosystem services, carbon offsets, biodiversity credits, water credits, wetland credits, nature-based solutions in general. We have biopiracy of human genetics and quantification of indigenous knowledge and culture. It's all the same legal and cultural tradition. In a series of excellent articles by John Bellamy Foster, uh, he pointed out that the main COP27 solution to saving the planet, make it an asset class and sell it. And in another related article, he said that the necessary conditions for the defense of the earth in the face of the current financialization juggernaut will require the greatest alliance of workers, peoples, and movements in the history of humanity. We're all in this together. So we're at a fork in the road where the proposition is to heal the earth, finance will lead. And it will involve enclosing, commodifying, and financializing nature, i.e. finance will dominate and will provide the credit. Uh, the fork involves commoning. 
common, the commons is a social ecological system in which people cooperate to govern and manage common pool resources. And it's decidedly not a pricing strategy. You don't attach a price to stuff. It doesn't mean that we all own it together. The ownership is not present in it. Now I'm going to present a case for a business model and cooperativism moving forward. And so I'm not talking about we all just you know, share freely and everything. And it's a little bit more nuanced than that. It's existing in the world as it is today with business, but without turning everything into a new asset class. So more context is that herders, indigenous land stewards, ranchers and farmers, our allies who are scientists, we've learned how to heal deserts back to prairies and how to grow topsoil and biodiversity. To get it done, we'll need holism, cooperation, commoning, rigorous landscape feedback, and popular control of money creation. I want to assert that communities can cooperate to heal our watershed homes. Let's hire land stewards, organized as watershed contractors, to heal watershed regions and continents, and point out that on a physical basis, in terms of energy and matter, this will be the largest physical project in history. So introducing the Land Care Cooperative a Vermont-based organization, cooperative, uh, a limited cooperative association. We're watershed contractors in community. We grow deep topsoil watersheds or catchments, water security and high biodiversity as a service. And we operate a learning system with landscape feedback for healing land. And we practice neighborly economics. The approximate structure is that this cooperative has started with the founding farms but eventually we'll have room for seven member classes, including investors, founders, workers, land stewards, community members, organizations, and all businesses and governments. And it's one person, one vote. There are investors. We, we do need them to capitalize this, but they don't get a, 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 an outsized amount of votes. They get one vote as an investor. The components that are most notable here, our land care trade network, which I'll speak briefly to, software for healing farms and watershed, watershed contracting, this learning system, and landscape feedback. We live in this world of watersheds, and every single one of these places is home, home to many, many people. And this gives us a chance to harness our love for our place, whether we're he from here or not, and to take care of and work to heal. Now, he privatizing something that was part of a commons before has never healed it. I can find no example in history where that has ever led to that outcome. But it isn't just these giant watersheds at the continental scale. It's right down to the little watersheds we live in, hydrological unit code 12 watersheds at, you know, on the order of 10 to 50,000 acres. And here's where we can make a tremendous difference and soak in every raindrop, clean it, hold it in living systems and deep, healthy topsoil. And we know how to do this quite fast. That's what we've learned to do. The founding farms who have co-created this cooperative, it's an incredibly brave group of people who love the land. And I went to them originally when I started organizing on this, because I not only thought that they could do the work of healing the land, but they could also cooperate. So healing watersheds, as I'm describing about, is largely a prairie strategy. We do fertility applications, high plant and microbial diversity. We deal with compaction. We address it. We do key line soil formation sequence, neighborly grazing, advanced nutrient management, and we bring it all together at once and couple it with landscape compliant infrastructure and forestry. Massive plant diversity is central. It, it leads to the mi massive microbial diversity. It harvests the sunlight. It grows the topsoil. It's deep rooted. On the far left, you can see a typical bluegrass sod root system, whereas this is the root system that works to rapidly heal land, even far faster than any forestry that I know of can do it. But that's not to exclude forestry. It's just saying the prairie strategy is as if we want speed and food at the same time that we heal land and grow topsoil. Bloom Train is one of our core programs which involves all members of the community working together and planting billions of flowers and doing the work to care for our insect neighbors that is required for the health of the whole system. The massive diversity and all of the other things I described creates, creates incredible biomass production, deep rooting systems, 
accelerated soil formation. One of the tools we use that's gotten some press recently is our cooperative invented a new tool called the rip sower, a subsoiler, a seeder, and a liquid applicator. And it, what it does is it accelerates the soil formation process and plants the forbs with the deep rooting systems into existing pastures and into brand new established pastures if we want. So you start seeing the forbs, these deep rooted broadleaf plants growing in stripes down the field and they become more and more abundant. They hold on through drought and they're incredible pollinator feed. This quote from Matt Schwanier says, the fields we rip sowed went from being some of our lowest yielding fields to being consistently our highest yielding fields. Water is more evenly distributed across the land. Our grasses stayed green and healthy long after the rest of the farm started to blight. And we saw a massive improvement in species diversity in each of the fields, which persisted in the years after we rip sowed. The soil is now aggregated to eight inches where it used to be three inches. We are seeing much less runoff from much less runoff from our fields than we used to. Now, this is all done with the shape of the land. Too much detail to go into, but you could call it contour compliant if you wanted to. And here's an example, some old research showing that runoff with ripping, contour ripping, runoff reduced by half with one contour ripping treatment. This is the speed with which we can address the existential threats of flooding and drought that we face today. Now, when we do this work, we can double infiltration rates readily, and we can start recharging our groundwater, which means the springs and the streams and the rivers and the wells all start to come back. And this is a radically different hydrology than we're used to, and then our current institutions and regulations are adapted to. So we'll have to be much more adaptive than fixed regulations, uh, thinking that in perpetuity they will continue to function. Water secure infrastructure for farms and watersheds is all part of this. And it looks like lots of these curvy lines. And we intend to build hundreds, and if we're successful, thousands of these landscapes in the coming 10 years because our infrastructure has to com comply with the shape of the land and obey physical laws rather than just straight law, uh, straight lines and roads everywhere, drainage ditches that in effect drain and dry out our land. So the local watershed contracting business model for healing land is very simple. It's the cost of production plus profit. This is one farm, a handful of fields planned out over four years. We do the work every seed, every gallon of diesel, every hour, with a modest profit on top of it. Nature is not abstracted or evaluated. There are no credits, no carbon, no water, no biodiversity, no wetlands, no futures, no derivatives, no land grabs, no bubbles. And the question arises, but where will the money come from to pay for the largest physical project in history? But the better question is where does money come from? And though we don't have time to go into it, you, everybody is invited to begin participating in our distributed, networked, economic think-do tank, if you will, called Growing Our Credit Commons. And that'll begin this winter and you'll all hear about it. This is about economic democracy and neighborly economics. Money and credit are our commons if we choose to act. And this is not far off pie in the sky, not at all. It's right here, right now. And when we say neighborly, we mean neighborly to our next door neighbors, neighbors around the world, future generations, and non-human neighbors. This is U.S. history, although it's been a very inequitable history, a settler democracy rather than a true democracy, where the money, the currency creation practices of colonists is what led to the American Revolution. And it used to be routine that at town meeting, when something needed to be done, a road, a waterworks, a town hall, the, the money would be issued, the currency would be issued and taxed back by the local community if the provincial assembly wouldn't allow it. This has gone through our history, but we've forgotten it. We've gone through a process of monetary silencing. Today, we have some 36, last time I counted, public banking initiatives in the United States with incredible progress in California, the heavy, pro high progress in Massachusetts, past attempts in Vermont, we have local working groups and local funding pools through the, the natural resources conservation districts, which are a way for local communities to harness federally created money. We have the Land Care Trade Network, which is a mutual credit network software that we're, we finished building and we're beginning operation of, and we'll be expanding that once we anchor it in our farm's food out to the community. We anchor all this, or we need for all this, our science, which is a scientific revolution, providing rigorous landscape feedback to heal land. 
Feedback, to quote Norbert Wiener, the father of uh, cybernetics, feedback is required for the regulation of a system on the basis of, it, of its actual performance rather than its expected performance. And this scientific system I'm describing takes land stewards' observations, our judgments, and management records, couples it with rigorous near-surface environmental measurements and 3D soil mapping, weather station, satellite remote sensing, couples that all together into measurement synthesis and provides us with landscape feedback in terms of energy, water, biomass, carbon, nutrients, and biodiversity. This is feedback to help us heal our watershed homes with our communities. Ending with some condensed thoughts that we can leave our children deep topsoil watersheds and economic democracy. Farmers are leading. Let's cooperate to heal our watersheds starting now. It'll be local, it'll be holistic. We'll be neighborly between working class people, peasants, indigenous peoples, and all true allies. We will not enclose nature as ecosystem services or let finance and corporations co-opt our work. Competent land stewards organized as catchment contractors are key operators. We'll learn and move to reclaim money creation to finance the largest public project in history. We'll work with existing institutions where they can help and we'll build new institutions as necessary. We'll work with conservation district local working groups. We'll operate our own landscape feedback learning systems for healing land. We'll leave our key, uh, we will leave our kids deep topsoil watersheds and economic democracy. So we invite all of you to take next steps with us. Recognize that we're years down this road and have made tremendous progress and are just now feeling ready to offer this to our communities. We're offering and inviting people to invite your neighbors and host a community land care talking circle in which we can talk about this in depth and learn together. That's it. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Abe. That is really exciting stuff. Um, I'm sure we're going to talk about that more in the q and I have uh, one more person to introduce it. Before I do that, let me remind you that after Kat speaks, we're going to do some Q&A. And you can be using the, um, the chat right now to get your questions in. Um, but let me introduce Kat. This is Kat Buxton of Birch Forest Farm in Sharon, Vermont. She runs Grow More, Waste Less, which is focused on community resilience built from the ground up. She also works with Regeneration Corps, Upper Valley Apple Corps, and is a co-founder of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. Um, she was the inspiration for this whole series, and we are thrilled to welcome her back. Welcome, Kat. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, I'm only going to take a minute, and I don't have slides. And how can I possibly top that amazing lineup of people who I am lucky enough to call my colleagues and my neighbors? Um, and it gives me hope to know that we can work together to try and build this future that we know is possible. Um, so Julie, Stephen, Caroline, Earl, and Abe, thank you for those wonderful presentations. Um, and yeah, I'm really lucky to work with you all. I guess I, I just wanna kind of tie it all together and end uh, the panel presentations so that we can get to some of the great questions out there and reiterate this sort of concept that ran through everybody's uh, presentations that our principles should come before this idea of practices and practices are based on models and models were created in different times that are not necessarily applicable to now. And I'm referring to models of how people work together, how people work with land. Um, and also, I think the thread also came through that there is no evidence that the financialized system that essentially 11% of the global population controls has led us to anything good. Not that life isn't beautiful and we don't all enjoy that, um, but we're in the sixth greatest extinction and what many are calling a climate emergency. And we are now essentially letting the 11% or the top 1% or the top 10%, whatever you want to call it, 
who are in fact the emitters of nearly all the carbon. I've heard statistics that say that the top 1% is uh, responsible for 40% of the global emissions and the top 10% is responsible for 60. Uh, that doesn't leave a whole lot left for the rest of us. But what it does leave for the rest of us is the, the power to understand that we are the global majority, the people uh, who are stewarding land and the people who have stewarded land for the longest are the ones that are maintaining 80% of the remaining biodiversity on our globe. These are primarily small share farmers, many of which identify as indigenous, people who have had their land forcibly wrested from them for generations, who practice a kinship and stewardship with land over the course of generations and are no longer allowed to because their land has been grabbed from them. I'd like to see us realize that what we really need to do is trust the people who hold the traditional ecological knowledge that are currently preserving the 80% of the biodiversity left on this planet. And that we collectively as the 89% can change our behavior first and change the way we think, bringing it back to Julie's slide where she had that little image encouraging us to do that. We can do this. We must be brave. We have to learn to live differently and we can't put this on our kids. This is our job to do and now is the time to do it. That's it. Beautiful, lovely cat, thank you. And now we are gonna jump into questions and that they can also include comments. Um, do know we don't have a lot of time for it. So try to, you know, be somewhat brief. If you want to speak, please use the reaction button to raise your, your hand. Um, you can also put things into the chat. Um, and uh, Julie, is there a question yet? I have one, if not. Oh, Denise, I see Denise's hand. Let's have Denise start us off. All right, um, I started to type it, but it was, it was gonna be a little long. So I will be brief, um, but I come at this with sort of from three angles. One is as a small business owner where we've been actually pretty successful over time following a lot of the stuff that you guys are talking about responsible so like all sorts of great stuff that it's been it's a lot of work but we've been able to do it the other sort of third is from an educational standpoint where i've studied a lot of this stuff that you guys are laying out totally agree with all of it the third part is what i'm really struggling with and my day job is with a mid-sized public, I'm sorry, private company that is very involved in, you know, it's it's an ESG type company. So not necessarily about the land, but still about sustainability. And going through the process of setting science-based targets. And and in some ways you all touched on this a little bit. So it's it seems like it's for everyone. But the reality is if we're really going to make a difference in hitting some of these the targets that we have to hit as a planet, it's really difficult. And it, in my experience, it's a lot easier as a small business to do our part than it is. I mean, the company I work for isn't even a large company. It's just, you know, it's 500 people. Like it's, in, it's a drop in the bucket when it comes to sort of corporate, but it's, it's not that easy to, to get to where we need to go. And I agree. And I can't remember, um, I guess the, I can't remember your name. I'm sorry. The first woman that spoke, but the, the whole conversation about carbon credits, totally agree with that, but it's, it's just a conundrum, you know? So I feel like we've got these policies that make a lot of sense and that sound right. But when you're actually trying to make it all come together, it's just not as it's not as easy and i worry that sort of those of us who are thinking it through are i don't know if we're 
too idealistic. I don't, I'm not sure. So it's, I would love anybody's thoughts on it. Um, but I just, I think that it's, it's hard work and I, I don't know that there's an, a, an easy answer to get there. So mm -hmm. would love anybody's sort of thoughts. And, and I, and I'm, again, I'm sorry, Julie, was that, I think, was that your, I, I missed your first name, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but anybody, mm -hmm. you know, but I, 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 feel like a lot of what you were talking about, I was, it was definitely resonating with me, <laughs> but I just don't know where we go. You know, I don't, I don't know what the right, I know what's, I know what doesn't work. I just don't exactly know what does work. Right. Thank you, Denise. Julie, do you want to take that or is there someone else who? Um, I did put an article in the chat about the science-based targets and um, accusations of fraud and, and that sort of thing with that relative to the ESG point you were making. Um, but I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in and share. And then when we're done, there's a question in the chat from Liz that I'll, I'll bring through. But anyone else on the panel want to respond? Abe? I agree with the hard work. It's often staggering how hard the work is of taking care of a hundred acre farm. And I think about the hard work of like raising a secure, happy child. And, and what you call on to do that is the love of family and community to do that. And to think that global finance should really lead that to produce the happy child doesn't really tap into what actually makes the world go round, which is very much more localized. And so mm -hmm. I feel like us in our places, harnessing love and care and community and cooperation, that's where it's at. And yeah, it's going to be a million hard jobs, a billion, a trillion, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, but it's, it's got to be devolved down to the local because the top down, especially led by finance, the notion that we can harness greed to, to, to heal the earth is it's insane so yes it will be hard but it's the work it's the hard work that we've been doing as creatures on earth you know all along and i actually think that if mm -hmm. we just go to the local it becomes a lot more manageable yeah and Thanks. earl yeah. yeah earl wants to jump in yep no you're on mute Get the mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I was going to say basically the same thing. We can't rely on government to help us, obviously. Uh, and what I was trying to say is that government's out to lunch. They're going the wrong direction. We have to rely on ourselves. And, and so what Abe said is perfectly right. We have to build the, the, the systems that we want to see. Uh, we have to build the... the <laughs> The, the change uh, that we want to see. So we have to do that starting in our own communities. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so it starts with us. Uh, we, you know, <clears throat> as far as these politicians go, we have to build the parade that they want to jump out in front of. Uh, that's how we get their support. If government's going to help us, you know, they have to get a clue. And, and so we are the clue. Um, so that, that's really what it boils down to. Uh, it can't be top down. It has to be bottom up because, uh, you know, they don't understand it. Uh, they only understand wall street. They only understand their, their, uh, bottom line. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and if we follow them, you know, in the end, you, you can't, uh, uh, eat your money or drink your gold. Uh, yeah. that's the direction they're going. So it, it's up to us. And so what we're talking about in, in this panel, that's what we have to do. The examples that we gave, that's how we uh, make change. Right. And so, the, you know, that's where we are. Yeah. Thanks, Earl. Um, there's a question from Liz Henderson in the chat that sort of relates to this theme. Does anyone have any ideas about how to encourage the NRCS to move beyond practice-based systems and Again, um, I think several of you from Vermont can speak to this, um, knowing the good work that Jennifer Burns at the White River Conservation District has been doing to enable that to happen. So does anybody want to jump in and talk about that? 
If I may just put in a plug for Jennifer, I, I put that into my slide, the SARE, for example, or CPS. You know, I'm utilizing those now for the projects that I'm doing. And it was Jennifer that that I work with in order to get these going. And, and uh, uh, so I would encourage everyone to tap into those programs to to, uh, uh, you know, help out on your farms or your garden projects. Um uh, uh, those are very viable and, and good programs. Uh, they're either grants or grant reimbursements, uh, you know, for your, your projects. I've utilized them and, and uh, uh, we're utilizing them on native lands all across the country and they work. Yeah, I would also jump in there. Um, um, I guess they were probably going to say the same thing. I was wanting to point to your slide about the local working groups. And um, that that is that maybe many might not know what conservation di districts really are, but there's this an in independent governance structure that's basically uh, seeking to assist farmers and also has a structure to organ help organize farmers and their feedback on how policies do or do not work for them and what should change. And that's the local working groups. And then um, they really, as Abe mentioned, have, have also the power to uh, to um, seek seek funding or, or, or allocate funding with their on their own terms through these uh, funding pools. And and really, um, given that the conservation district are also heavily underfunded, um, yeah, the more you become active on your local uh, conservation district level uh, level and uh, address these shortfalls and participate, the more the more change can happen. Great. And then um, Stephen has a comment. And before um, you jump in, I just want to mention earlier in the chat, I put a link to an sign-on petition, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is adding historic amounts of funding to these programs so that more um, funding can go to farmers um, for implementing these um, conservation practices is at risk in the Farm Bill. So do sign on to that if you can. Stephen, you want to jump in? Sure. And um. Shout out to Elizabeth Henderson, who's <laughs> one, one of my great heroes in this world as a CSA farmer and a uh, policy genius and a uh, tireless uh, advocate through NOFA. Um, so, um, oh, just to uh, echo what uh, others have said, uh, we, we've also through the years worked with EQIP and CSP, which are both um, natural resources conservation service programs. And equip was very effective for us as a small farm in terms of uh, getting our intensive management grazing infrastructure up and running, and which was really transformative for our uh, our land practice, and um, uh, also uh, some other infrastructure like a compost stacking area and, and things like that. Uh, but then we graduated from there into the conservation stewardship program which really I, I do feel does take a much more holistic uh, uh, view, whereas uh, EQIP is often sort of uh, uh, putting the uh, band-aids around the perimeter of the farm to, mm -hmm. to stop leaky farms from polluting the rest of the watershed, uh, though not in the case of the grazing, that's certainly uh, getting right into the heart and meat of uh, transforming land. But um, CSP is much more focused on how do we regenerate, begin this, cycle or, or um, spiral of regeneration on this land by taking a more holistic view of it and um, trying to enhance the overall landscape function and uh, uh, biodiversity of uh, the production systems. And um, so for us, that's meant like pollinator hedgerow, uh, uh, planting trees into pasture, establishing a silver pasture system, particularly on uh, very steep parts of our, our old hill pastures. Uh, um, a coppiced windbreak, um, mm. and uh, and through that association, we've moved into an association with uh, Megan Giroux's uh, Ways Commons, which is working with the USDA through the SARE grants uh, to uh, begin planting next year some uh, 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 alley cropping with fruit and nut trees that will have uh, annual crops in between. Uh, and also we've uh, done a uh, 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 chestnut and a uh, Hickory nut uh, windbreak uh, separating two hay fields. So, um, but more than that, um, thinking about it, it gets one approaching the, the uh, whole systems of the farm as an organism rather than um, mm. patching these practices together and, and stacking those 
practices in a way that where they really um, uh, build exponentially on, on the restorative powers of each other. But we need to really keep the pressure on, uh, stay politically, policy, engaged in policy to make sure that those uh, NRCS dollars aren't going primarily to uh, uh, uphold commodity farming in the state and 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 invest in huge uh, um, concrete structures like methane digesters for confinement, 2,500 cow confinement dairies and, and, and touting this, these things as green solutions. We really need to keep those dollars going to the small diversified uh, farms that are uh, building for uh, resilience in the future. I think Abe might have also wanted to weigh in on this. Is that right, Abe? I think my points were covered that the IRA quintupled um, conservation funding, and, and we have two competing threads. One is that uh, over $3.1 billion were allocated for climate smart commodities, which is a good example of the state de-risking the commodification of nature. And that's mostly what that's about. It's mostly carbon offsets and other ecosystem services. But the flip side of it is these conservation districts were created to enable democracy to do the hard work of caring for our places. And we have some really profound leadership here in Vermont, new leadership, which actually managed to redirect 70% of NRCS funding to local working groups and local funding pools in the last place they were. We have that opportunity in front of us, but it's, we're going to have to exercise democracy and do the work of showing up to meetings and thinking and planning and agreeing in a sacred agreement with each other and with the land and our community to take care of this place. Thanks, Abe. Um, I'm going to be, we need to be wrapping up here in a minute. And I know, Julie, you have some resources to share. Um, are, are you ready to do that? Yeah, I have actually been sharing them along in the chat, okay. but I can put them in again as you wrap us up. Okay, so Julie has some calls to action and um, ideas for, for moving forward, but you've heard a lot of those today. And I, you know, partly in, t in response to what Denise said, but kind of just in the spirit of everything we've heard, I, I think one of the, the things that I learn over and over is that if I'm sitting home alone thinking, huh, what can I do? I'm gonna get overwhelmed and I'm not gonna figure it out. That part of the key, like Ava was saying, is that we do it together that this is not an individual project, this is a community project, this is a, a um, democracy project. There's all sorts of ways we can say it, but it's by coming together, by joining your conservation district, by joining your NOFA, NOFA working groups, by, you know, investing in, in or, you know, looking into these different economic and commoning models that's where our power is going to come in and where we can start to shift things and all of the people that you've heard from tonight are folks who are involved in that sort of work and um i'm hoping that they have inspired you and given you ideas of where you can plug into uh julie do you want to say anything about the things that you're putting into the chat um i've put in a chat the nofa chapters have a farm bill policy and as a part of that there is um, a statement on rejecting false solutions so that's um, one action item i think um, abe had a, a good call out to everybody to join your um, listening circles is that how you called it so i think that's a great um, call out there and then i think it would be really good to close um, with this request we have from Birdie if asking if Kat could talk about the social mycelium, which I always enjoy hearing as well. <laughs> well, actually, let, let me say a okay. few things and then, okay. then I'll have that. That sounds like the more um, lovely creative moment to, uh, to end on. <laughs> to yeah. end on. Let me do some of the, the less um, great, more nuts and bolts stuff. So I want to uh, say a few things and share some info and links. First, if you are able to, tonight was free, but uh, not for no fun Seacoast permaculture. So if you are able to contribute financially to support tonight's program and both of our organizations, we would be incredibly grateful. You can do so either through our web pages. I'll put these in the chat, but I'll also say them out loud here. SeacoastNHpermaculture.org, NOFANH.org slash donate. And there's also a place to send a check, but I'll just, I'll pop that into the 
chat. So thank you for that. I also want you to know that we have many other programs that are coming up that are always going on. Again, I'll put some links in the chat, but let me highlight two. One is that we have a joint Seacoast Permaculture NOFA New Hampshire book study this winter. It starts on January 4th, and we are reading Saying No to a Farm-Free Future by Chris Mage, and he will join us towards the end of the book study to talk with us about what we've learned. Also, NOFA New Hampshire's Winter Conference is scheduled for February 10th at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to do a big, as visible as you can, not everyone's computers are on, round of some kind of applause, excitement to all the panelists who have worked really, really hard to put tonight together. And we're just so incredibly grateful for all the work that they're doing in the world. And then I want to hand it to Kat. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bertie. I love you. Thanks for asking the question. The social mycelium. Um, you know, it's really about eco-mimicry, biomimicry, our greatest teacher, our caregiver, our home. What can we learn and how can we be more like um, mm -hmm. nature and live as nature? Um, the mycelium is referring to the mycorrhizal networks that connect everything under the soil. It's how trees and plants talk to one another. Um, it's one of the things we know very little about, kind of like the ocean and the human brain and the human gut and space. Um, and apparently how to take care of a planet. We don't know how to do that. We've got a lot of history and we've got a lot of examples where uh, people can work and live and be in harmony with our mother, our caregiver. And we have more examples of eminent destruction and extraction. And the social mycelium concept to me is asking us to be collaborative and as selectively intelligent as all of the billions of organisms in the zoo of life in the soil, which we know so little about. So can we slow down? Can we lose the sense of urgency that makes us move with haste and make mistake after mistake? Can we slow down and be more like the mycelium? That's right. Thank you. So beautiful, lovely, lovely moment to end on. And again, thanks to everyone for speaking. Thanks to everyone for attending. Mm -hmm. And um, okay. we uh, will be continuing these conversations at conferences and um, more programs. And we'll all keep at it. Mm -hmm. Good night, everyone. Thank you all. Good night. Thanks, thanks Amy. Thank you all. Bye.